I were really um, pessimistic, or you could even say realistic, about how the next few weeks were going to play out. Um, and I have to say that uh, this this has been a really it's not been it's not been a great month in terms of the pandemic with so many people falling ill, so many hospitalizations, and so many deaths. And um, uh, and today, actually, I wanted to share some light at the end of the tunnel because we all need to have some hope on how we are going to get out of this pandemic in a in a way that is that is saves people's lives, protects the NHS, and does all the other things, uh, and hopefully will will allow us to reopen the economy and schools and all the other things that we love about life uh, sooner rather than later. And the central thing, and um, I know that David always starts by saying that he that he talks about the things he was wrong about. I'm going to claim something that I was right about. And the, the thing that I was right about from the start was always that vaccines were going to take us out of this. And I've been attacked by people on social media saying, waiting for vaccines is not an option. And then I went, we're not waiting for vaccines. People are actually studying, they are developing them. It is a phenomenal achievement for us as uh, humanity, I would even say that we managed to make a vaccine in less than a year after a, after a virus has been discovered. This is, this is truly one of the most remarkable things that has ever happened in science. And it's going to be Nobel prizes all around. Not for me, I hasten to add, but for the people that have actually uh, developed these vaccines. So um, this is an interesting sort of top 10 list of the countries that are doing best in vaccinating their population. And the clear number one is uh, Israel, where 36.4% of the population is now fully vaccinated, which means they've gotten the two jabs that gives roughly 90, 95% of protection against COVID-19. Um, and even though I first to criticize the government on, on many different points, I, it's clear that the United Kingdom is doing relatively well, or really well, actually. Maybe not the, the, the stratospheric levels of, of Israel, but uh, the UK is doing well with, uh, with vaccinating, uh, even though only 0.9% of the population is fully vaccinated, so have, have had these two jabs. Uh, many people have gotten their first dose, and we already know from other studies uh, that have gone have gone on that these uh, that that first jab is already quite protective. Of course, not not as protective as those two jabs will be, and maybe that will come back uh, later in my presentation as well. But clearly, this is something that we can be proud of as a country. Um, and so this is some very recent data from, from uh, Israel. It's a very complex slide, so um, I apologize for that. But the only thing that you need to remember is that the red um, line is people in Israel that have not been vaccinated. And the blue line is people that have been vaccinated, just have had a first jab. And you see what we've also seen during all the vaccine trials that after two weeks, they're not, uh, your immune system is primed and the protection against COVID-19 uh, starts to kick in. And then this, this line um, basically still rises a little bit uh, and, and starts to flatten essentially when you give a second dose. So this is, I, I, um, I may sound like a broken record but I've, because I've said this before, but it's very important for people to realize that after they've been given the jab, they have to be uh, very careful for at least two weeks and probably longer, particularly until they get that second second jab, which gives almost complete protection against COVID-19. Um, so Israel is definitely a success story. And so this is the uh, number of new COVID cases that have been uh, found in the UK. Clearly uh, here showing that lockdowns work. For some reason, people still find this controversial that lockdowns actually work. I'm not, um, I'm not a proponent of lockdowns because I think it's a last resort option when all else has failed. But it's clear that in the, in the case of this crisis that we had around New Year's Day with incredibly high numbers of cases, there was no other option than to go into lockdown. And of course, you can see then that the number of cases has dropped. So in Israel, there is 
a lockdown, but particularly there's this uh, massive vaccine drive. And you can see that that also leads to a drop in cases. But but you can also see that over the last week or so that that number of cases appears to have stabilized. And there's people in Israel that are concerned about this because they realize even though 35, 40% of the population is now fully vaccinated, that's not the level that you will get herd immunity. And so if people start to behave irresponsibly at that time, then you still get, um, uh, you still have transmission of the vaccine. There will still be people that have to be taken into hospital and there will still be people that, that die. So you will only have protection when really 70% of your population will have been vaccinated. And that's something that we need to keep in mind, all of us, because that, that number is still quite far away in the, in the UK. Um, and I, I do hope that by summer, this year we'll, we'll get close to that. That would be a phenomenal achievement. But during that time, um, we still have to be quite careful in trying to minimize the spread of COVID-19. So um, the lessons from Israel, Israel for the United Kingdom. So I think what the most important lesson is vaccinate as quickly as possible. And I think the UK is doing that. So we're really doing that very well. If you then want to exit from lockdown during this vaccination drive, I would do it gradually um, and to, to a large extent the government seems to be doing this, although I, I don't particularly like the way that the media has picked up on the different dates that uh, we are supposed to basically uh, lock down. I think that that's really going to be driven by the number of cases in the community. Um, and as an example of where I don't think lockdown is being released gradually is this policy of reopening all schools and universities on the 8th of March. I would have started with primary schools, then wait for another two weeks, then the secondary schools, and then the universities, if only because we already know that primary schools are at the lowest risk of having a role in transmission, secondary schools a bit more, and universities even more. And then the final lesson from Israel is um, that um, uh, we shouldn't be doing anything stupid until more than 70% of the population is fully vaccinated and so um, I don't have a lot of hair left but I almost pulled it out when I saw that there are Rishi Sunak has been talking about eat out to help out too which is an absolutely insane idea and the, the first eat out to help out scheme is quite convincingly shown to form the uh, have formed part of the the, the first wave of infections that we saw in November in, the, in this country. So I do hope that that, that uh, plan is going to be uh, put on hold to at least a large proportion of the population is fully vaccinated. So uh, things on the vaccine front are looking really promising. There is definitely light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still not there. We haven't crossed the finish line yet. So we still have to be uh, careful in how we how we behave ourselves and how we, uh, uh, the protective measures that we take, like wearing a mask, keep socially distancing, et cetera, et cetera, because this is still a virus that spreads very easily from one person to another. I think I would like to leave it at that and then give over to David. Stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Willem. I'm just trying to work out. Can you see that okay? We can see it. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm just gonna... We, we, we can't see you, yeah. This... Yeah, if I just skip forward a little bit, okay. So just remember, um, we haven't quite worked out the order a little bit. So um, remember the hashtag uh, WM Lib Dems, uh, people want to tweet during it. And um, uh, that's both our Twitter handles there. Um, I'm just going to, I, we did this before and actually it is refreshing, I think, to think about the things we got wrong. And I was thinking a little bit back to the last time we met. So this was just over a month ago. And I think actually there was a feeling of dread that people had. And the analogy I made at the time was it, I felt a little bit like the, um, if you think about those silent movies, the, the, the woman on a train track with the railroad train coming towards you. But I, the, last year we had a blindfold on. This time we didn't have a blindfold and I knew the train was coming because we could see the community cases going up. Anyway, I've been hit by the train. 
but some of the, the, the end carriages are, are rolling over me. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about what happened. Okay. <laughs> but I'm also going to say about the things I got wrong as well. Um, and, but if we go back, the first time we did this, uh, it's actually quite an interesting beat of uh, Bromsgrove history, this actually. I, I think Tris Harris is on there from the Bromsgrove Standard. The first one we did this was back in April. And I was saying how we needed testing and we needed uh, improved border security, um, you know, like Australia. Well, uh, testing, okay, there's, we've got tests coming out of our ears now, and that's fantastic. Um, what I would say is uh, the border security thing, well, we haven't quite got that. This was yesterday in Parliament. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about having this Australian tal, um, um, hotel quarantine. Well, there's 15,000 people arrive a day. There's only 150 go to quarantines. That's 1%. And there's very little checking of what happens when people come back. Um, so I'm not convinced this is going to make much difference. I'll be interested in Wilhelm's thought on that later. Um, what I think was interesting, we did talk about the various um, COVID idiots in the media that had said, you know, everything's going to be okay. Um, one of the most famous ones, Professor Sakura. And we haven't heard a thing from them in the last month by and large, okay? And so it's interesting how the media has kind of wised up that actually they were talking rubbish. Um, but I think for all the reasons that Wilhelm just said, we just need to be cautious. And I'm, I just worry that um, uh, Britain will suffer from its you know, optimism and want to open everything up. Um, and you know, mistakes can happen because we can see just how quickly this virus can replicate. And if you go back to when Wilhelm was talking about the whole eat out to help out back in July the 4th, last year when things opened up. Then there were only 600 cases a day, okay? Um, and just look where, where, where we went through and how quickly this can come up, basically. Obviously, we've got the vaccine now, and that's fantastic news, and it does change things. Um, but I was also just thinking what else has happened. So I've been doing quite a lot of work, again, about um, hospital-acquired COVID. In the middle there, you can see me wearing this mask like I'm out of Chernobyl. Um, well, that reflects just how our change in PPE. Um, try taking a neurological history dressed like that is a challenge. Um, but I have to say it shows how seriously uh, we're taking the PPE issue. Um, and it does very much matter in terms of the community prevalence. And certainly where I work in Sandwell and Birmingham, particularly Sandwell, is very much uh, COVID central um, at the moment. And it, although things are going down, it's worrying that those areas, particularly those areas which are um, uh, well, like Sandwell, or you've probably heard of the news, Alan Rock, uh, basically the poorer parts of town, uh, any decrease is much slower. And equally, often those are the areas where the vaccination rates are less. So, you know, this really is becoming a condition of poverty. Um, and that's something that we need to think of because we don't get out of this until we all get out of this. Um, and my other reason for mentioning is I, I never would have thought them a month ago that I would be involved in not one, but two different cases. Okay, I can tell you about one and I can sort of tell you about the other one, but you'll understand why I won't. Um, I've been following this since December and um, essentially data is extremely important about the way we um, look at healthcare. It, it has been so important for the interpretation of infection control, data, PP, everything has been vital. Um, but this case does trouble me. Palantir is a big um, US data company, um, which uh, has uh, basically it originally got formed with links to, the, believe it or not, the CIA, security services and immigration in um, the US, basically. Um, and as part of the emergency planning, um, they have helped out with the original plans uh, to do with that. Uh, for the, the, the summary price of a pound, um, they're now got a contract worth 23 million pounds. Um, and um, what we're calling for is to just review about this process because they're trying to get a more permanent contract for two years. And I think, you know, if you think how well the vaccination program has worked, it's worked so well because of the NHS, because of pr um, primary care networks. Whereas Converse, if you look at um, where things have gone badly and real badly, the whole uh, PP issue and, and uh, track and trace and things, has largely been from some very dodgy contracts and things. So I think getting scrutiny about this is very important. So that's legal case number number one, which um, uh, is we're trying to basically go for a judicial review. Now, 
I'm not going to talk about the other case uh, for obvious reasons, but I'm going to talk about a very, very, very similar case um, in Leicester. Um, um, I'm, I'm just not going to talk about the case I, I was involved in for patient confidentiality. Um, but it has been a very stressful month. Um, uh, as we all know, just the number of deaths and things like this. Um, this was a case in Leicester of um, a, a, a woman who had COVID, um, who was pregnant, uh, delivered, but was uh, extremely ill. And the unanimous view of the medical professional was she wasn't going to survive. And it had to go what's called to the court of protection uh, to discuss this. Um, so I can't talk about my case, um, but I've gone through the process. My reason for mentioning it was the medical legal process hasn't changed. But my one of my heroes, and I, there's a number of people I would just love. I'm so looking. Well, I'd love to meet. I, I doubt very much I'll meet. I'm looking forward to meeting Wilhelm actually in the flesh. I'm, but um, on the on the um, right hand side of your screen is Justice Hayden. Um, who was the judge in the case I was involved in. Uh, and uh, I, actually, my view of the legal profession has changed. He was just one of the most remarkable judges. And uh, if you can picture a case like this, which was incredibly emotionally draining, uh, I probably spent just about 12 hours writing up the medical report on this one patient in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it just gives you an idea of workload. Um, so that was uh, things that happened. That was the other case that happened since we last spoke uh, over a month ago. But things I got wrong, I have to admit, you know, I think back in December, did I really think that we'd be talking about over 18 million people in the UK have had their first vaccine, but they aren't protected until they've had the second vaccine, but that's fantastic. But one thing that's going to be, and although that is fantastic, a really key aspect that needs to happen and really hasn't worked properly uh, in the pandemic is this trace, track, trace, isolate and support. Um, because we, as I pointed out, there's going to be variation in both um, higher numbers of infections, particularly in areas which are socially deprived and lower rates of vaccination, particularly in areas which are socially deprived. And we really need to work on those areas to protect us all. OK, but it's, you know, it's very easy um, for those of us who can afford to work from home. Um, many people cannot, and um, you know people need to be uh, able uh, able to you know do the right thing. And obviously, if you get contact with track and trace, you're legally bound to isolate. But if you got the bills to pay, um, you need support. And um, so I'm, I've done some uh, FOIs uh, across district councils in Worcestershire. Um, I've got data back from Bromsgrove, Witchhaven, and Wire Forest. Just by way of example, Bromsgrove Council talked about this and of uh, just over 450 applications for these 500 pound grants to help people um, isolate. Um, in fact, over 70% are rejected. Um, and it's not clear to me what the appeal process is. Um, and I think this is terribly important because as we try and suppress the virus, we must be able to support people uh, when they're isolating. Um, and, you know, I know of uh, working single mothers who, um, who were petrified that if they might catch COVID from their children at school, basically, um, who, haven't, who got turned on from one of these grants uh, and, you know, not able to afford the rent, that kind of thing, basically. Um, so I think this is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and, you know, we've spent, uh, what, £22 billion on this track and trace system, uh, over £2 million a day on private consultants. You think if we're spending that kind of money, we could um, spend a little bit of money to support people when they're isolating. And it comes back, these are things I showed in the very first talk back in April. It's boring, but it's basic. We have to control transmission. We have to have the systems in to detect, taste and isolate. Uh, we have to minimize outbreaks in, in at-risk sections. Think about preventative men measures. And I still find it bizarre people arguing Oh, maybe we should stop using masks in schools. No, I think masks are important. Um, think about the importation risks and work with the communities um, because we come through this all together. So lots of good news, but we just got to carry on. So I will stop there for questions. Sorry, just unmuting myself. Excellent. Uh, would you mind uh, unsharing as well that screen, yeah. please, David? Thank you. 
Uh, fabulous. Thank you very much. Uh, I shall just bring myself into the picture as well now. Um, so, uh, yes, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Again, guys, please get your questions in. It's always good to hear from you. Uh, and uh, the first question is going to be from Adam. But before we get to that, because we were just talking about vaccines, a, a couple of weeks ago, one of the big political um, hot potatoes was, do we vaccinate teachers? Now, of course, they chose not to. Do you have a view on whether that was the right thing to do or not? What's your perspective? It's uh, it's tricky, actually. Well, it's because um, you need to think, um, well, see what Willem thinks, but, but it's actually, if you look at the occupations that are most at risk, uh, it's going to be... Uh, you know, healthcare workers, it's going to be things like meat pack workers because it's a cold environment, um, you know, taxi drivers, things like that. So there is a risk uh, to teachers, but actually, I, I think in some ways the argument's probably moved on um, because, um, the, uh, to be honest, GPs have done such a fantastic job of vaccinating. Um, I think uh, they should have concentrated on the learning disability population earlier. Um, it is tricky because then it's how you define things like learning disability, because there can be very mild learning disability and there can be very severe learning disability. So it's, um, you know, I think in some ways the argument has, has moved on, but uh, I agree with Wilhelm that I, I think the idea of a big bang, uh, all schools opening at once, you know, it's inevitable that cases will go up and it's how we manage that risk. Uh, as we start, and that's why we have to keep measuring it. It's, it's, we've got a real difficult media environment where everyone just keeps thinking, you know, this is the clock. The, that timeline, there's a lot of fudge on it that, you know, only if we all behave uh, are we going to stick to that. And I, I worry, you know, the areas where I work in, 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 in Sandwell and Birmingham, you know, it, the rates may not go down anywhere near as fast as they are in other areas. If, and, and, and you know, it's difficult uh, because it does vary in different communities. Okay, Th thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, so, well, I mean, you got a view on that? Cause... Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, William. Um, well, I'm, I'm first going to say it's complicated. Uh, um, and, and to some extent, you would, it, this is not a question that you maybe should be asking uh, me. This is like an ethical discussion. So you need to almost have a professional ethicist here in the room here because it's like weighing the value of human life and uh, I work with microbes I'm, I'm not trained for, for that so correct uh, answer so I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. and I'm going to say um, to public so, health to some um, extent as well <laughs> yeah so so that, that it is it, uh, I think that the government's policy of, of, of starting to vaccinate the elderly and then working their way down until the and the uh, and the vulnerable that I think on the whole, that's a good strategy. I think particularly with primary school teachers, the, 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 the risk is not that high to get catch COVID um, unless uh, and people, well, uh, children will need to wear masks. I, I agree with that completely. So, so I think on the whole, I, I agree with that strategy. Something that is uh, worrying me a little bit is, and that's something that I said a month ago where I went, uh, it, it may not make me very popular, but I think we should be vaccinating our prison population with some um, urgency. I don't think that has happened. Um, and uh, basically that's, that's, an, that's um, an environment where COVID is spreading very quickly uh, and uh, which is causing a lot of suffering among uh, both the people working in the prisons and the prisoners themselves. And I, I do hope that those type of institutions will soon be vaccinated as well. Yeah. I, I think they are actually, because one of the biggest outbreaks in Bromsgrove was in the prison. And I remember one week the yeah. rate yeah. went up about a thousand percent, but it was, it was all in the prison. Yeah. Uh, it, it would, I, I'm gonna wage it. I think the population that we have in this meeting would be quite sympathetic to that view about uh, prisons and vaccinations. But it would be interesting to get people's views. So do feel free to put in the chat what well, you think on uh, that on that question. On the uh, on the other hand, I got very worried uh, last week. There was a comment from uh, sorry last yesterday in the Guardian from um, who's the chair of the COVID recovery group, Mark. Um, yeah, you know the the, the Conservative MP who, who's yeah. so right wing group and was arguing that we should open up 
and uh, you know if people don't want to be vaccinated that's their problem okay which is completely the wrong approach you really have to work with communities and you know there is um, a lot uh, it's it's actually understanding the anxieties that people have about vaccination and that's equally true even within healthcare professionals believe it or not okay mm -hmm. so you know we're actually having to do work um, so the kind of anxieties that people have about vaccines uh, in BME communities and others is equally true in NHS staff, okay, as it is in the general public, because not surprisingly, the NHS is the biggest employer, um, uh, reflects society. Um, so, the, you know, all of us need to do uh, each and every bit to just be positive and encourage people about vaccination. But, you know, white middle class Dr. Nicholl in Hagley uh, uh, might be talking to his patients in... Uh, you know, Hansworth and things like that, but they're going to be speaking to, you know, their imam, their priest, their, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and getting health information from all sorts of different angles. And that's always been the case with every pandemic. Um, we just need to be aware of that and keep repeating the message. Okay, uh, let's, let's get to Adam's question. So um, Adam asks, did David and Willem notice an increasing, num an increasing number of deaths of people 80 plus after the vaccine? He asks because he was recently in, in one of the care homes and staff said they'd had no deaths of COVID, but since the vaccine they've had five and they wondered if there's any relation. Can I, can I start yep. uh, answering that? And then David can pick up on that. So, um, of course, I don't know what the situation of this particular um, um, care home, so I can't really comment on that. But many of the stories that, uh, let's say, there's a link between people dying and COVID vaccinations are coming from Norway. Uh, because Norway put out a press release, the Norwegian government put out a press release uh, late in December, early January, saying that they've seen that they were investigating uh, that's uh, among uh, their, uh, uh, the elderly that were vaccinated. So what Norway did is they, they did it extremely systematically. So they started with the oldest people in the society and then they worked their way downwards. Uh, and so what happens if you take uh, a random group of uh, a thousand people that are a hundred years or older, whatever you do with them, uh, a proportion of them will die within the next four weeks, um, sadly. And, and basically that's what has happened here in Norway is that, and, and possibly in this care home as well, if you take a group that is elderly and that is in, in probably in a poor health, um, you would probably expect to see people dying uh, for whatever reason. And so th there's absolutely no evidence that the vaccine contributes to that. So um, people may counter this and say, well, but we have a care home where this ha happened. So five people died after the COVID vaccine while we didn't have any deaths before, but there, that's just a random fluctuation. There will always be also be a care home where the exact opposite happens. But it's, uh, so th these findings are being monitored um, and they, there is absolutely no evidence in no country of no vaccine because we have multiple vaccines that we're using that they cause increased deaths of people that have been vaccinated. I mean, it is absolutely staggering, not just that we've got these many vaccines, but just how bloody good they are. Um, I mean, normally we get excited if a flu vaccine gets 50% uh, and the effectiveness of these vaccines is nothing short of miraculous. Um, what we have seen is actually the opposite of what the questioner is seeing is, I mean, sadly, we're seeing, we've actually seen younger admissions with COVID in this wave than we did in the first wave. Um, and if anything, even more BME ones than last time. Um, now, I may be biased. I mean, obviously, most people get COVID are okay. Uh, I'm afraid because I'm a neurologist. The ones I see, it really hasn't been good. You know, so, you know, you know seeing a 40-year-old who'd had no previous illnesses uh, dying of COVID is just grim. Um, and... Um, you know, it's so it, it, exactly the opposite. So, in, in fact, I'm into, uh, there was some data I've seen from Israel earlier this week suggesting that they're seeing uh, an increasing rate in the younger and therefore unvaccinated population, uh, potentially. And I suppose there, I've got a slight worry as we've vaccinated the older population, um, will you therefore then get spread from the, the, the if you think about it from the virus's point of view, it's going to go 
towards the population that's most unvaccinated. And I'm just anxious, if you look at all the surveys of vaccine skepticism, it's higher in the younger groups, basically. So if going back to Willem's point in his slides, the sooner we vaccinate people, the better. So we've got to, you know, think and act like Israel, basically. Thank you. Um, next question is from Barry. Um, now, what, yeah, and a really interesting question, Barry, um, because he's talking about vitamin D and what merit there is in actively pro uh, promoting, I guess, people uh, stocking up using vitamin D or, uh, you know, talking more about vitamin D deficiency. So uh, ahead of next autumn, winter, is this, uh, should this be a public health campaign? What do you think? Um, th um, there have been large trials on vitamin D and they've not shown to be uh, useful in either the protection or treatment of COVID-19, as far as I know. David. I think that's yeah. right. And I don't think NICE, there's been some debate about that. I think NICE ha haven't ruled that. But I, I understand the arguments. Um, uh, I'm, j I'm just not sure that it's conclusive. The thing I do think is useful is having a pulse oximeter, okay? Um, and um, Only so I, can, I can check my, uh, 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 yeah. I, I must admit, I got one for, I can check on 99%. Uh, that's excellent. Okay. So um, uh, I, I think it is, I mean, obviously things are getting better. Okay. But I think uh, this isn't going away. And it's, it's likely that we will have next winter, you know, I suspect COVID will be around in some way or other. Um, and I think a bit like when you were a kid and your mum would check your temperature. Um, I think maybe having a pulse oximeter is what we will be having 2021. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm not bringing any patient confidentiality, but Phil Mackey from the BBC thanked me uh, for telling him to get a, a pulse oximeter because he reckons it kept him out of hospital. Um, and it, basically, uh, uh, what you need to know is what your baseline uh, oxygen saturation is. And if it's anywhere near 94%, uh, you need to be speaking to a doctor, I would suggest, basically. Um, and part of the problem with COVID is that people get this, what's called happy hypoxia. They think they're okay but their oxygen has been very low. And that's probably what caused a lot of the deaths in the um, first wave, basically. And, you know, treatments are now much, much better. Um, and, you know, not just dexamethasone, but the tozolumab and other drugs and things like that are making a massive difference. Equally, that causes its own problems because obviously people are then in hospital longer, um, which feeds into the whole um, ITU um, side of things. So, you know, at peak, um, our intensive cares were running at 200%. Okay. I, I was, you know, I remember seeing one patient in, you know, like I'm a neurologist. Okay. I'm not a surgeon. Last time I was in an operating theater was 30 years ago. Okay. I had to go to an operating theater to see a patient in an operating theater because that's where the ventilator was. Okay. Um, so, you know, the NHS was really, really, really stretched. Um, and and David, if I may, because I, that, to, to people who are not medical that they might think okay there's a ventilator there so that's that's your that's the last ventilator presumably because yeah, that's yeah. the last one you'd want to use and that's why yeah. it's so bad yeah yes. and we you know we were sending patients up to newcastle okay so at peak there were four thousand patients in the country in the country on itus and 10 percent of them were being sent to other hospitals um so you know i don't i don't think when we were talking about leveling up uh, the plan was that we were levelling up intensive cares by spreading the, the COVID love across the country. But in mm. effect, that's what happened. Um, so, you know, we were really stretched because the UK has got one of the lowest number of ITU beds per head of population in the country. But, you know, people, that's why I really worried, oh, the NHS coped only by stretching to the absolute limit, you know, um, really was um, very tight. And, you know, it was... Uh, it's, you know, and I worry almost for the staff who aren't used to end of life care or aren't used to that kind of illness who get, maybe get redeployed, um, having to manage like the 40 year old that I mentioned earlier. It's, it's really tough, you know, and, uh, uh, and, you know, normally in ITU you'd be having a one to one ratio, but having a one to three ratio. So uh, with very complex patients, with all sorts, and it's a multi-organ disease. So not just thinking about the lungs, but you know, maybe the need dialysis, other things as well, basically. So an awful lot of things happening. So it's, uh, uh, I was right to be fairly grim the last time. I'm also right to be feeling optimistic, but only if we all act together and don't do anything stupid. Let's keep on that word optimism because we've got a question from Judy Priest next. So thank you for your question, Judy. And she says, 
we haven't heard about any variations recently. Does this give you any hope? Uh, uh, overdevelopment, they're still around. I've heard a lot about <laughs> <laughs> no, I've heard a lot about variants recently. Um, it, it is that is one of the most pressing concerns that we will have variants that escape the vaccine. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the situation is right now because there is clearly the South African variant, which seems to be escaping at least partially from the uh, sum of the vaccines, but I don't know exactly which vaccine. So the, I, I'm just yeah. probably- Yeah, and there's a Brazilian one as well. And then earlier in the week, mm. I read about the Californian variant, uh, which the Los Angeles Times are talking about. So I'm afraid we're gonna have to get used to variants. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think it's, but, but, you know, can't emphasize enough how fantastic the vaccine is. And technologically, it is relatively easy in the same way that they think ahead with the flu vaccine and think, well, actually, which, which, uh, which variants are likely to be prevalent next winter? Can we just rejig the vaccine a little bit? And you may need to have a booster. Um, but, you know, that's, it's, I think the whole media cycle, we just focus on the next few weeks. I'm afraid we need to think of really the next year, couple of years, basically, um, of, of how we get through this. Sorry, <laughs> you may not be expecting that, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're going to be here for a while. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank. Thank you, folks. Um, just um, just before uh, Judy mentioned that there was a bit of a discussion about Japan. I wonder if you could say quite briefly, be, um, you know, because I guess most of our news is focused on us, Europe, and the US. But I know you've got contacts further afield than that. Are there any interesting sort of takes on how this virus is going in countries that we might not necessarily hear about every day? Um, well, my take on it is. Uh, the countries that managed it well, uh, there is a high level of trust um, in the government, in the organisation. And, you know, OK, probably most people have seen about New Zealand, but not just New Zealand, you know, the way Australia have dealt with it, the way New Zealand have dealt with it, um, South Korea. And I guess a lot of that is probably because of the experience that they had um, with SARS. Um, so I think trust is actually a very, very important, which is why I'm feel so strongly about that judicial review in the Palantir case because I, I just if you just google Palantir and the things they've done it's the kind of thing that would just uh, raise alarm bells uh, if, if people like me are trying to engage with the black community in Birmingham uh, to get vaccines um, so you know trust is really really important and but and, and that and that you know Japan is an example they've they've had a long you know, if in winter, you know, people wear masks and things like that. And, you know, that's one of the most remarkable things this year is we haven't seen flu uh, because essentially people are washing their hands and wearing a mask. Can I, can I share my screen for a moment? And I, I'll just uh, show you the, um, let's say the current data from uh, Japan. So this is, many of you might notice how I was in data, which is one, it's a great resource for, all things COVID. Um, and basically, this is the curve for Japan here on the bottom. And this was their, I don't know, second <laughs> wave. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's clear that they are doing, so even if, even if there was a, an increase in the number of cases there, it's still so much lower than it is in, in the UK. And I'd say if you, if you think across Europe, one country which I think has been Let's see if I can quickly find it because I, I think it's actually a very instructive story is Ireland because Ireland did a really good job until early December this year uh, and then they opened up they were like yep it's really low we get it's safe to go to the pub again so they opened up pub and restaurants and they saw the largest spike in COVID in in Europe if not the world at that time and then of course they had to go into lockdown and that was again very successful but of course, this has led to tremendous amounts of, of patients and, uh, and deaths in Ireland as well. So it is, it, we can definitely still learn from countries like Japan, where they wear a mask, where they um, uh, follow guidance very um, carefully, probably. And countries like Ireland, which has done an, actually quite a good job in containing COVID for most of 2020, and then basically they completely let it run out of control in the last few weeks of this of last year. That's astonishing, actually. Thank you for sharing that, Willem. I think uh, 
uh, I'll be looking at that site later on. That's really interesting. Yeah, uh, shocking I spike I in, it, in Ireland. Yeah, I, and I have to be, yeah. I didn't know that actually. So thank you for that. Um, Kim, we're coming to you next. And I noticed you've got two really good questions. So thank you for those. I'll give them you in order, guys. So the first one, uh, Kim asks, can I ask what you both think about the idea of children self-testing at home? Do you think it's a sensible preventative measure? Yeah, I got a... I've got, I've got a funny feeling about it. I don't know. Well, I'll tell you why. Because it depends on the prevalence of uh, the condition in that area. So, you know, for example, okay, I work in Sandwell. That's COVID central. Testing there makes a lot of sense. Okay. Whereas, I don't know, if you looked in somewhere like Devon, uh, where the prevalence is a lot less, um, there is a potential risk of when you get positive, it's actually a false positive. So I'm... Um, I'm kind of unsure about that, uh, but uh, I don't know if Vilma's got a different view about that because I actually think some of the, you know, some of the infection control stuff um, make sure, I mean, we know so much more about ventilation. I don't think there's been enough talked about schools and ventilation, um, masks, you know, those kind of things I think make a, a, a difference. I just worry slightly as people have an over-reliance uh, on testing potentially. And like the lateral flow test that I think I talked about, I'll my box of lateral flow tests um, is, you know, it's good at picking up uh, COVID, but just because it's negative doesn't mean, you know, you can have a false negative as well. So it's, again, it's quite complicated. Yeah, so, and just the so, logistics of this for teachers. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so so in, at the University of Birmingham, we have a very large sort of testing facility right now, which uses the lateral flow tests that David just showed. And um, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, get into details and name names here, but I've had colleagues into massive screaming matches about whether that was useful or not. And so it is an extremely controversial uh, topic. What I what I think is the um, what I think is the bottom line for for um, so again the point that David made is important. So if prevalence is really low, doesn't we really, it, it is pretty useless. But if you see it as a way to pick out um, individuals that are, have COVID and that are completely asymptomatic, then it might actually be really useful. So in the, the experience at the University of Birmingham was that generally they started testing people when prevalence was quite low in those populations. So they didn't find a high number of students, but they uh, did find a couple that were positive. And then they confirmed that later with the gold standard PCR test. And one of these, these individuals was extremely positive. So at very high viral load, so it was probably spreading it around very easily. Uh, and he was completely asymptomatic. He had absolutely no idea that there was something wrong with him or her, I don't know the gender. Um, and so, um, so if you see it like that, it can actually be useful. But those tests were actually taken by qualified staff at the university that had been trained in doing these COVID tests. I'm very skeptical to have, I don't know, 12 year olds taking swabs and putting them into these lateral flow devices. I, I think that is, that is not going to be very useful. Yeah, particularly when they're not reliable already. Oh, is it me that's frozen? I seem to have cut out. Oh dear. Are we well, back in the room? Good. Oh, that's good because at least they're not at work. Sorry, I think I'm back in the room now. I think I'm, I, uh, like you, everybody froze for a minute, so it must have been me. So sorry if I'm <laughs> cutting over you there, guys. i just come back in the room. Um, we're going to come to Kim's second question in a minute, but actually, um, Rebecca, thank you for the comments you've made about misinformation that's been sent to people um, uh, from black and minority um, communities, uh, because this is something that I, I am, I have a bit of a worry that that we're missing this much like we did uh, pre um, the Brexit vote as well, actually, that these sort of things are being shown very much to some people and, and, and others of us are not seeing them at all. I wonder whether we should be highlighting this and, and sharing this with each other, actually, and perhaps campaigning on it because we've got to stop this, haven't we? So, uh, Rebecca, that's, that, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to move on to Kim's um, second question because I'm one, very one, conscious one, of time. Jennifer. Yes, because of course I think you it's can. a really important point. And yeah. I've, I've recently talk, spoken with a 
uh, councillor on, on the Birmingham City Council, the Council for Hensworth, and um, and she's been she's been very outspoken on 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 let's say all kinds of vaccine misinformation. It's it is it's really um, it's rife, and and for some of these are are, are very understandable. For example, uh, 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 members of the Black Carib Caribbean community often refer to as uh, to Tusk Tuskegee, so which is a completely uh, uh, unethical study that was run by the U.S. government from the 1930s to the 1970s on on the on African Americans. Um, uh, basically, they, they they had syphilis and they were not treated uh, because they wanted to see how what what happens if you don't treat syphilis. And it's an awful, awful breach of ethics. And it is um, white people generally don't even know of this. And in the black communities, this is this is a very well known story. And so it is a it is really difficult. And we and I'm very much aware that if um, if I, as a white middle-class male with a funny Dutch accent, starts talking to people from those communities, that doesn't really work. And we have to work with, let's say, the leaders of those communities, like the councillors and uh, imams and, and other, other people that are, have really large networks in these communities try, to try and fight vaccine misinformation. They are safe, they don't make you infertile, they are halal. Um, um, I'm probably missing a couple of very, very important other other pieces of misinformation, but this is this is this is crucially important going forward. I'll tell you a funny story. Okay, so uh, I happen to know uh, Adil Ray, uh, Citizen Can, and I've been pestering. I had this image of having Citizen Can uh, driving up to the vaccine centre, going, <laughs> "Get the vaccine, bloody good." But in fact, he'd already had it planned. So I don't know if you've seen that video he's done. It's absolutely brilliant. But I, I'll, I'll stick to my day job and stop being a script writer. <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting one. And uh, Rebecca, I'm, I think um, we need to, uh, you know, as people who care about this sort of stuff, we need to find a way to really challenge this. But, but, and of course, if we don't know it exists, that's a problem. So uh, perhaps we can highlight that in the virtual HQ. Uh, obviously making it very clear that it's utter cobblers before we do so but um, at least we've got a chance then of knowing what uh, what misinformation is out there and we can challenge Sorry, it. Can I, can I make one other point about vaccine yeah. misinformation? Um, I think the most important, so sorry, maybe I'm, it may sound like you, I'm, I'm picking on you now, Jennifer, but I don't mean to, but you said it's utter cobblers. You're, you're right, <laughs> it is, don't get me wrong. But that's uh, in, a, in a way for, uh, of a strategy to try and convince people to, to get a vaccine. That's not how you do it. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just going to say that now. So how you do it, if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm concerned about vaccines because, I don't know, uh, uh, side yeah, effects, uh, making it fertile, you'll have a conversation with them. Like, why are you worried? Um, uh, I, I can show you these data. Do, is that, do you think that's convincing? If they say no, it's all a conspiracy or whatever, you can try and say no, no. But it's been shown now in many countries like Israel, it's safe, and, and so you have that conversation. At the end of the conversation, you say, and I do hope that. So please make up your own mind, and I do hope that you take the vaccine. And then you you stop that interaction, and you, then you let the other person's brain work. Um, it doesn't work by shouting people saying that's complete nonsense. Just take the vaccine. That's not constructive. Um, yes. And I also admit there is a part of the population in every country that will take not that will not take a vaccine no matter what. And then don't waste your time on trying to interact with these people because they're I'm afraid they are beyond convincing for, for taking a vaccine. Sorry, I have very strong but, opinions about that. I know, this. but then that itself yes. is a challenge uh, in NHS. You know, yeah. I have my Hep V vaccine because you know, I work as a doctor and, and there will become an issue where actually it does need to be mandatory, but yeah. not today. Uh, right, I, I was just about to type it in, but Rebecca, I can see your hand up. Now we have got uh, a couple more questions, but uh, let's, let's let you uh, come in and, and say what you want to say. So, so one of the ways that I tackle the misinformation is um, I looked at the messages on WhatsApp that my mother-in-law being sent 
and I searched vaccine conspiracies looking for other conspiracies with the same photographs yeah. and I managed to find one from six years ago related to the MMR vaccine so one of the images have been used quite a bit with that because it's the same old story over and over again mm. so I just started saying this image is from this and they've just changed the text this is something that's been shared before um, to try and debunk it because I think simply saying it's a load of rubbish I agree it doesn't work you have to say well actually this is just recycled from earlier conspiracy theories uh, and, and, and you know give them an understanding that people somehow enjoy spreading misinformation and the anti-vax movement's not a new thing it's just more prominent at the moment yeah oh and also the speed in which we can pass misinformation is just staggering yes yes indeed thank thank you rebecca thanks very much for coming in with that that's much appreciated and yes just in case i wasn't clear before when, when we're sharing these things in the virtual hq what i want you to be is clear that you know we're not sharing it because we believe it we're sharing it because we want to raise concerns that this is the misinformation that's out there um because uh, i wouldn't want you to share something in our virtual hq and it make it look like uh, you're in accord and of course there's always a problem as well with sharing these things because then you were uh, raise their profile as well so we've got to do that carefully too um okay so coming to um i've lost you kim but it was a good question uh, it was about the vaccines wasn't it where are you there you are. Uh, so uh, Kim's question is, based on the people I've known who have been vaccinated, the Oxford vaccine seems to have more side effects than Pfizer. Is this the case? Yeah, um, I'm actually, I'm, you know, basically, whoever, whatever you get offered, I'd say yes. Uh, I, I really wouldn't get, get picky about this. In fact, I wish I meant to show a picture of my brother in Moscow having his Sputnik V vaccine. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, uh, so I'm not that convinced. Uh, maybe I should, I should ask my wife. Uh, she's a vaccinator. Um, but um, I'm not too... I mean, there can be... Obviously, there can be individual clinical reasons. In fact, a friend of mine has um, severe allergy and has to use uh, EpiPen, for example. So she had to have the um, AstraZeneca, um, uh, vac you know, it, so it was... But those are individual cases, basically, rather than a general theme. Okay. We, we've got two more questions in the chat, and I'm conscious we've got three minutes. So let's try and get them done. Um, what do Willem and David think of the education minister's advice that parents should decide if their children should wear masks in school? Uh, um, I actually don't think this is helpful, and I think we should show leadership. I mean, I, I, you know, I can particularly see there's instances, you know, if you've got, um, uh, let's say, child with uh, severe autism or learning disability, that uh, just a mask won't work. But I, I think, actually, um, you know, this should be, uh, particularly secondary school kids, uh, they are like young adults, basically. Um, and, you know, it's almost should be part of the uniform. Okay. Willem, any, anything to add? No, nothing to add to that. I, yeah, I, I think it's messaging yes and okay. i think this goes back to leadership i mean I, to be honest i think all the mps they should be wearing masks indoors and things like that you know if you think of the way the biden campaign they made such a big deal they all wore masks around it you know and it, you know a fish rots from the can you hear me again folks i seem to have lost out lost connection Can we take Mel's question about the COVID Perfect. Yeah, I, I've stopped my video because it seems that I'm, I'm not, uh, I keep cutting out. My apologies for that. The vaccine passport issue, that's a tricky one. Uh, I, I guess um, I, I can see it. That there is a debate to be had about that. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that in a minute. <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> um, but you know, I think there's a very strong issue for healthcare professionals and staff in social care for, that it's mandatory um no that hasn't had yet and i think it would require legislation and it would require involvement with unions and things like that um different issue about you know going to shops and things like that that just i just can't see that happening the priority is to vaccinate as many people as possible um travel trickier um
Um, I'm, I'm going. To, so I, I think Jennifer is struggling a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, okay. I'm back in the room, but I've I've taken the video off just to make it a little bit easier. I, we've got. A, yeah, my a sincere apologies to everyone. I don't know what's going on all of a sudden. Um, uh, we've got a question from R Richard Whelan. I don't know if we've answered that, which is the, uh, and and I think that that's possibly the last one, as I know you've answered the passport one that's just come up. So uh, the question from Richard is, is the government's strategy to allow cases to increase, knowing that the vaccines will act as a check on hospitalizations and deaths? If so, is this the right strategy? Um, if you put it like that, it's not the right strategy, <laughs> because uh, right now we're still not at a level that vaccines will protect significantly against hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and I, to be honest, I don't think it's the government strategy right now. They still seem to be relatively careful in how they want to open up society. Uh, I do share the concern that we, I suppose many of us, if not all of us have, that the government is going to reopen too soon uh, with people not having had their second jab or not having more than, what is it, 70% of the population having full protection. I think that would be risky, as is being demonstrated right now in Israel, where they are trying, where they're finding this right now, that even though they have 40% of the population vaccinated, their, uh, their number of cases is seem, to, seem to be stabilizing at a relatively high level. They and just to remind people, remember July the 4th, we were having 600 cases a day. Okay, and look what happened. Okay, so it's up to us, you know, how many waves do we want to have? Okay, I do not want to have a winter, I don't want to have a month like the month I've just had. <laughs> and yes. I, I, I don't, I don't I'm, think any of us do I think we can share, you, share, we can, uh, share your sentiments there. Um, um, I think we, well, we've certainly an answered all the questions and sincere thanks to you both again for being here. Uh, really, really, uh, it's good to hear that at least there's a bit of uh, hope uh, for you guys. Um, you know, you're the ones who've been at the front of this and got us through. So we're extremely grateful. Um, so yes, thank you. Now, David has put in uh, into the chat, uh, asked for um, anyone to chip into Bromsgrove Lib Dems. Um, I think what you do know is all of that money is going to be put to good use in campaigning hard uh, in that area. So if anybody would like to chip into that uh, campaign fund, please do. Um, and, and on that note, I think we'll build, bid you all a very good evening. Thank you so much for coming and joining in with us. And thank you very much again for your questions. Really, really great questions from you and very much appreciate it. So, do we do another one? But then the next one, should we do it, I don't know, Willem and me in the pub garden? It could do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was thinking that just beforehand because, I mean, on a practical level, everybody's really getting into campaigning now. So actually, uh, yeah, it might be tricky. from a distance, but people are going to be making calls. It's going to get to a point where people are going to be doing something every day um, before uh, the elections. And my goodness, we want to get some good election results, don't we? So, um but yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe from the maybe. pub garden. Pub garden, maybe, yeah. Sounds <laughs> like a good idea. <laughs> At a distance. To be perfectly honest, I think that then that means that the next one will be in August. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, well, well, we'll watch this space, shall we? But, With uh, these words of caution. Indeed. Yeah. But, but yes, thank you so much. Don't forget hashtag WM Lib Dems. Um, don't forget if you want to support David, the, it's in the chat. And do feel free to, um, you know, make any comments as you go out if you've enjoyed it. If, there, if there's something we didn't cover and you'd like to, do feel free to put that in too. But if not, enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Do you want us to hang on a little bit, Jenny? Jennifer? Yes, can do.